Uh, my name is Erez Diane from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. And uh, as Donnell mentioned, we will be uh, describing how to kind of do it yourself, make your own endocyanin green camera. Uh, there, we have no financial disclosures. Um, tissue perfusion assessment is critical to everything plastic surgeons do. Every day we look at the tissue color, um, we look at capillary refill, we look at uh, bleeding at the edge of a flap to try to assess tissue perfusion. And those are all subjective evaluations. There are a number of objective ways that we look at tissue perfusion using surrogate markers. Um, for example, we can look at oxygen partial pressure or temperature. Um, here is an image of a gentleman's face. Um, here is his nose and here are his eyes. Um, and this is the FLIR device, which is a um, device that attaches to your iPhone and basically it looks at the surface temperature as a surrogate for tissue perfusion. Um, many of these devices are sophisticated, but the problem is, is that they often are not sensitive enough to provide us um, data to make uh, clinical decisions intraoperatively reliably. Endocyanin green has really increased in popularity um, for tissue perfusion assessment. And there are many uh, clinical circumstances where um, the uh, tissue perfusion is questionable or there's a gray area. And one of them is when performing even simple debridements, um, the interface between perfused tissue and non-perfused tissue can be um, not clear. And endocyanin green, by injecting it intravascularly, uh, gives you a better idea of which tissue should be debrided and which tissue is vascularized. Um, in larger cases uh, where uh, perfusion and vascularity is of utmost importance, such as a jejunal flap, for example, um, it's really critical to know that the anastomosis is not under too much tension, that there's enough blood flow getting there to prevent uh, major complications. So um, endocyanin green has been very useful in cases like that. And of course, uh, for all plastic surgeons that perform breast reconstruction, uh, you know, assessing the mastectomy flaps has been, um, it's a constant struggle. Um, especially now as uh, prepectoral implants have come back into popularity, um, and especially in cases that are challenging in patients uh, who have been radiated um, with implants, it's really uh, very important to assess the mastectomy flap perfusion to decide if you should change your course of action, if you should maybe not put an implant in, if you need to uh, debride some of the mastectomy flap. Um, so endocyanin green has a, a lot of utility in that area. Um, this is a case uh, just from a few weeks ago at Brigham and Women's Hospital of a gentleman that had a long history of cocaine use and he had a previous forehead flap um, that was divided a few months before and he didn't have enough support for the dorsum so our plan in, in this operation was to come in and um, place a, a cranial bone graft as a cantilever bone graft to provide support for the dorsum. Uh, so our first step before harvesting the bone graft was to create a pocket where we wanted the bone graft to be. And as we were dissecting the pocket for the bone graft, we noticed, as you can see here, a pale appearance. It doesn't seem like the dorsum and tip are well perfused. So we used our device uh, through an IV injection of endocyanin green to demonstrate that the relative perfusion of the dorsum and tip is really not good when you place an elevator to mimic the tension of a bone, of a cantilever bone graft. Um, so we actually ended up changing our clinical management and we aborted this case. We just placed a silicone spacer to delay this flap to prevent any, uh, any complications with tissue perfusion. Um, lymphatic imaging is an area where endocyanin green has really been at the forefront, um, especially in areas of sentinel node identification. Literature shows that endocyanin green is more sensitive than blue dye, um, both in sentinel node identification in the melanoma literature as well as breast cancer uh, sentinel node identification. Um, in identifying um, lymphedema and diagnosing lymphedema, endocyanin green has also been very useful. Here we can see um, injections into the web spaces of a normal foot, and you can appreciate the endocyanin green traveling up the dermal lymphatic channels, and you can appreciate how discrete those lymphatic channels are in a normal foot. In a foot that has lymphedema, the same injections can be placed in the web spaces, but you see a disarray of the endocyanin green, the stardust pattern, which is very classic for lymphedema. And before people were using endocyanin green to image lymphatics, this was a very uh, challenging, that you couldn't really see the lymphedema, it was more of a clinical diagnosis. Um, classically, nuclear imaging using technetium was used for lymphocentigraphy, um, but the issue with this is it really only gives you a static image as opposed to this dynamic image. And these images uh, for the nuclear imaging cannot be performed, obviously, in the operating room. The patients have to travel to nuclear medicine, and it's logistically more challenging. So how does it work? 
So in a very simplistic way, the endocyanin green is injected into, uh, into the vein um, to assess tissue perfusion. Usually the anesthesiologist will inject it intraoperatively. Or if you're looking at lymphatics, you can inject it intradermally or subcutaneously. And it requires a light source at a specific wavelength to excite the endocyanin green. So you have a light source that excites the endocyanin green, and when the endocyanin green falls back down to ground state, it releases energy in the form of photons and wavelengths. And the goal is to have a filter here that identifies those wavelengths, and then you have a camera that images that. So it's a relatively simple, um, simple system. Endocyanin green is very safe. Uh, there are really only minor reported complications in one out of every 40 to 50,000 patients. It's been FDA approved since the 1950s uh, for intravascular use. And it falls in the near infrared spectrum, which is basically outside of the visual uh, light spectrum that we're used to. Um, as opposed to the classically used fluorescein dye, endocyanin green has a number of advantages. One of the advantages is that its half-life is only three to four minutes. So you can image a patient multiple times during an operation. The dye doesn't linger around. Um, the, the other advantage is that you can image deeper tissue planes as opposed to fluorescein because the wavelengths are longer. Um, so there, there are a number of advantages of endocyanin green. And it's excreted through the biliary, um, biliary system, which is useful to general surgeons in terms of their imaging. These are just the properties of endocyanin green. So um, when you have a light that's exciting it, you want the light to fall in this energy uh, curve, which is 750 to 800 nanometers. And then the photons that are released after the endocyanin green falls back from excited state to ground state are going to be in the 800 to 850 nanometer range, which is here. And this is what you want your filter to be sensitive to. You want your filter, ideally, just to image the wavelengths under this curve. So the light should excite in this curve, and the filter should pick up the wavelengths in that curve. There are a number of excellent devices on the market. Um, they are expensive, but they're very sensitive. The two most popular ones are the Spy Machine by Novadec and the PDE Hamamatsu machine. Um, there are a number of other devices, but the um, essential components of them are very similar. They both use LED light sources to excite the endocyanin green. And they have uh, filter devices, typically what's called a bandpass filter, which I'll briefly describe, that picks out the wavelengths that are emitted after the endocyanin green goes from an excited state to a ground state. And then there are minor differences, such as working distances and field of view, depth of penetration. Um, so here we can see the PDE Hamamatsu, and this is the SPY device. Um, these devices are, as I mentioned, very sensitive. Um, some of them, such as the SPY, have... Uh, photo pro image processing software, which gives you a nice uh, color kind of topographic picture of what's well perfused and what's not. And it, people that have more experience with it find it uh, useful in their practice. Um, one of the downsides of these devices are um, some of them are large and all of them require tethering to a base. So they're not very portable. And they also do come at a, at a significant expense. So how do you do it yourself? So as we mentioned, you need a light source to excite the endocyanin green. And then you need a filter and a camera to identify those wavelengths that are emitted. So um, I'll demonstrate this with a number of different cameras, but this is an, a standard SLR camera um, that you can convert. And here is the light source, which can be easily bought online. It's just an LED uh, portable light source. And you can combine these into one module that's portable that you can bring with you just as you would a normal camera to the operating room if you're going to different hospitals. And it, it provides some value in uh, assessing tissue perfusion and lymphatic imaging. So as I mentioned, you can use an SLR camera. You can use a standard point and shoot. You can use a webcam. Uh, the key thing, regardless of what camera you use, is that you replace the filter. And what you want to image is this, this curve. So um, I would use a, what we call a bandpass filter, which all that means is you eliminate all the wavelengths underneath this curve and above this curve to give you um, an image of just what the um, emission waves are. So the filters that I've used um, give a 90% transmission within the 800 to 850 nanometer wavelength, which is right under this curve. And these filters can be purchased online. Uh, they're not very expensive. Um, this one happens to be $320. Um, they can range anywhere from $300 to $600. And you can uh, choose the size, the wavelength. 
So really the difference between a commercial camera that you would just buy and a modified camera is the lens. So in a normal camera, you're visualizing the regular visible spectrum, you know, just like a normal camera you would buy. Once you replace the lens for a near-infrared lens, you're blocking out the visible spectrum, and you're just imaging what the endocyanine green is releasing when it goes from an excited state to a ground state. Um, as I mentioned, this is called a band pass filter, so essentially you would buy a filter that would image under a range of the wavelength of endocyanine green. And then you need a light source, and these light sources are easily uh, accessible. Most people use an LED light source, um, and the light source that I happen to use is within the 750 to 790 nanometer range, which is right in the hot spot for exciting endocyanine green. So how do you do it? So um, you take whichever camera you have, and you can Google how to disassemble these cameras, and they usually give you a very step-by-step -step, um, instruction guide on how to do it really um, in a very, for most cameras, it's actually uh, easily found. And ultimately, you will take the camera apart into all its different components. But the key thing is finding the sensor unit, which is here, and the shutter mechanism, which is here. And you want to separate those so that you can work on the sensor unit. Once you get to the sensor unit, depending on the camera, sometimes there's a, a dust filter, which is this, which would be removed. This is the normal filter that comes with the camera that just shows you the visible light spectrum. And you simply remove it and replace it. And you replace it for a filter that just identifies the excitation, the emission wavelengths of endocyanine green, which are well known and can be purchased online. One caveat here is that you need, ideally, to have a filter that's a similar thickness to the filter that's already in the camera to allow you to have the best image. Um, so this is a video using a, a modified camera. This is actually a webcam that's attached to a laptop through a USB port. And we were just doing this in the operating room. We had some extra ICG. Um, I injected it into my web spaces. The camera's here in my hand. This is an LED flashlight. And uh, this is for lymphatic imaging. You can watch it. Oh, excuse me. So here we see the image of the ICG. And this is just playing through QuickTime on your laptop. Nothing special about any software. Um, and then if you want to get a closer image of it, you can see the endocyanine green traveling up the lymphatic channels proximally in the arm. And you can put a resistor on the light source that can change the intensity of your, of your image. So it's just a simple way to image endocyanine green using a, either a USB-based camera or an SLR or whichever point-and-shoot camera you have, um, just to give you an idea of where the ICG is. So if this may be overwhelming, you don't want to take apart your camera, you think that, you know, I mean, it's a scary thing to take apart an SLR camera. Um, you can actually buy these cameras that are already converted for you. Um, and the thing is, is that these cameras are not sold for the purpose of imaging endocyanine green, but if you know the wavelengths, you can identify a converted camera that would fit your needs. Um, so there are a number of companies, and my email's at the end, I'm happy to share them with you, um, that will sell you a converted camera. They're all under $1,000 or so, and as long as you know what, what to look for in terms of the wavelengths, you can identify that and you have a light source that will help you image it. Um, there are companies that also sell filter kits uh, specific to ICG or similarly, if you know which wavelengths you need, you can find the specific um, filters for that purpose. And as I mentioned, they, they range um, depending on the lenses anywhere from 300 to 600 uh, or more dollars. Um, there are limitations, you know, they say if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So there are limitations. I think. Um, the spy machine and the Hamamatsu machine are very sensitive and they're very useful clinically because they're so sensitive. Um, my, um, my opinion on the converted camera is that it would be good for someone perhaps in private practice that doesn't necessarily have the budget to buy a spy camera or maybe doesn't have the room or maybe they're going to multiple different sites and it's a relatively inexpensive mechanism to image endocyanine green. Um, this is a picture of a deep flap, and here we see the spy image, which you know gives you um, image processing software, which really gives you a nice topographic color image 
of what's perfused and what's not, which, which uh, the converted camera doesn't give you. It just gives you kind of a black and white image of the endocyanin green. So the sensitivity is one difference between the expensive machines and the more converted machine. Um, depth of penetration largely depends on the light source and how that's penetrating through the tissue. Um, ultimately, it's very difficult to quantify or compare these imaging devices because side-to-side -side comparisons are often uh, very challenging in the operating room. Uh, there are a number of other devices that don't use endocyanin green. Um, some of them use uh, spectroscopy, um, imaging soft tissue oxygenation without the need of dye. Of course, these devices uh, are not useful for imaging lymphatics, but there are different perfusion assessment um, technologies that are, that are on the horizon. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions.